busted in. We broke down the door, we came to win. TLA season four, it's a whole new game. We the ages of change. Whole new scope with a whole new range. It didn't exist, so we built our own lane. We all knew the risk, it's a cold ass game. But first and foremost, we reppin' the fans because we nothing but fans living out our dreams. Crossing the pond with these 32 teams. There's only one road and there's only five kings. Welcome to 32 Kings Road. Hosted by the League Ambassadors, I'm Ambassador Kenny Ken Ken, and it is my pleasure to be here today with my, my brothers, brothers truly. Uh, as a reminder, you can follow us everywhere on social media. Our handle is at the League AM. That's Twitter. That's Facebook. That's Instagram. Also, please check out our website, theleagueam.com. Please subscribe to and rate our YouTube channel, League Ambassadors. Uh, on today's show, uh, we'll talk about. Uh, Kobe Bryant. Uh, we will also continue our NFL's bottom 100 uh, review. We've got our final five teams. Um, and we'll also preview the big game this Sunday, uh, Super Bowl 54, uh, the matchup between the San Francisco 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs. Kev, what you sipping on, sir? Gentlemen, I... Uh... Haven't been happier to see you guys um, for all the wrong reasons. I think it was weird is that last week's show, I promised that I would get trashed on this week's show. Uh, I was wishing it was under different circumstances. So, yes, I am going to drink all of this Crown Apple tonight. Yuck. Um, <laughs> hey, with ginger ale or ginger beer, it's pretty good. Well, start um, drinking. <laughs> oh, I, I am indeed. Uh, so... We obviously know why we're here uh, on Sunday. The uh, sports world, the entire world, our world had our hearts ripped out. I don't know how else to put it. Um, we learned of the tragic death of Kobe Bryant. Uh, we're mourning the death of everyone that was on board the helicopter, of course, but this platform is for sports, and we're going to talk about Kobe to the best of our ability. Um, I'm rocking this hat right now for the Mamba, my fellow Slytherin house brother, uh, so let's jump right into it. I'll start. Kenyon, I'm going to kick it back to you. You probably heard the least from you since this happened for obvious reasons. You were one of the first people I thought of. Um, we'll go around the table, but Ken, how you feeling, man? Mm. Um, you know, I couldn't really speak. Um, and I don't want to, like, ramble. So um, I just... I wrote something. Um, greatness comes as a result of either mastering a skill or by mastering your will. Not everyone will be able to master a skill, but every single human being can be a master at exercising their will. Growing up in Los Angeles, I didn't have a father to teach me that. Willpower was not in my mother's tool bag. No one said to me, if you want those sneakers, go get a job to make money to get the sneakers. I wasn't challenged to prove how badly I wanted to learn how to drive by being made responsible for scheduling lessons. I did not know about the magic that can make other people and outside influences acquiesce to what I wanted until I watched Kobe Bryant. There wasn't a defining moment. I don't know the exact age. It's unclear if I first saw it while he was on the basketball court or off of it. But for the last 20 plus years, I was a witness and a student to the lessons of willpower being taught by Kobe. Sunday, January 26th, I felt cold. A little exposed and a little afraid because one of my suppliers of inspiration dried up for good. Long before it became a hashtag, a moniker, or a marketing campaign, Mamba mentality for me was about one thing, the power of your will. Not everyone is willing to do the work to experience the magic that comes as a result of tapping into that power, but Kobe was. And because I bore witness to that and am still here, I can do the same for others. For me, that's the legacy of Kobe. In time, I'll be able to celebrate it. In time, I'll be able to appreciate the profoundness to this moment for literally the entire world. But right now, 
it's still a little foggy, man. Should have definitely asked you to go last. Less. <laughs> Bars. <laughs> I would say it again. Bars. Less. You know what? Talk I, to us, man. I didn't write anything down for this. No notes, no anything. Um, really, I, I looked at this in two ways. In 1996, he was drafted. I'm a diehard Laker fan. I was flipping through some pictures last week, and my son saw a picture of me at the parade in 1988 holding up a Lakers shirt. So I'm a diehard Laker fan. In 1996, Kobe was drafted. He was 17. I was 18. Um, And for the next 20 years, from September to June, basically, I watched him play three times a week. Out of those 20 years, I might have missed 20 games. And he played for my favorite team. He wanted them to win as much as I wanted them to win, or even more. And I can't say that about a lot of players that even play for the Lakers, that they care more about winning and losing than I do, as far as they're concerned. I watched him, we grew up together, basically. He was like a brother to me. He, from doing dumb shit in our early 20s, to getting Mm -hmm. married, having kids, and you watch the, the maturity of him. And it felt like, someone that I have known for 20 plus years and watched grow up, got ripped from us Sunday. I, 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 was, high, I was showing property Sunday morning. I hopped in the car. Um, when I finished, the radio popped on and was like, we lost a legend, <clears throat> but I didn't hear the name. So I, I go on Instagram, go on Twitter. Nobody says anything. Dev hits the group chat with the TMZ link. And I'm like, oh shit. Like, is this real? Like, this this can't be real. And it didn't get any better from there. So that, that was, that's one part. Like, he was a brother that got ripped from me. But the part that hit me the most and the part that has me tear up when I'm scrolling down Instagram or whatever is the fact that on February 6, 2012, my life changed when my daughter was born. And... That's because I no longer was here to protect myself in L.A. I had to make sure that nothing ever happens to Callie. Everything within my being is to make sure that she is good. And to know Kobe had the same feeling about like feeling about his daughter that I have about mine, knowing that I am here to protect you. I am here to be the man that no one else will ever be for you. And to know in those final minutes, like the hardest thing is to think of those final seconds when Kobe as the adult knows what's about to happen. He sees it coming. He's holding his daughter, his daughter screaming, and he's trying to calm her and comfort her. Cause that's the only thing I can imagine myself doing. Telling her is telling it's going to be okay. And that that's the thing that got me. So his, his, his love for his children, his daughters, his wife, like, and then to have that ripped away. We saw it last year with, with Nipsey and, and um, Lauren London. Nipsey has a song riding where I'm just trying to get home to my baby. That's the way the hood goes. And to think that something you can do every day, I've done a thousand times in the last 20 years, and you never make it home, that was crushing to me. That it's still, it's still, like you said, it's still in the fog. I still don't understand it. I still, when I hear people talk about it, 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 when I see R.I.P. Kobe, I'm literally like, nah, hold on. No, that's real. Like, it's really real. And it, I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to be a while before I'm like, this is the true reality. Yeah. To live and die in L.A. Um, Devin. Um, for me, it's you know, it's it's a little different uh, from you know the LA guys. I wasn't uh, born out here. I wasn't um, not a Laker fan. Um, my thing with Kobe starts back from you know high school because uh, I was at a basketball camp in Pennsylvania where someone from his school was there. You know, from Lower Marion, they were talking about this kid who was about to go in the NBA. So it starts way back from there, from like my tenth grade. Um, 
I initially wasn't a big Kobe fan. I thought that, you know, um, you know, being being a huge Michael Jordan fan, I was like, oh, this guy's a you know a fake Michael Jordan wannabe, like you know uh, Reggie Miller famously said when they were when they had their fight. Um, I wasn't always. Uh, I didn't. I appreciated his skill, but I didn't understand like when he was young, like yo, you got you got Shaq down there, feed the post. Like I just it didn't make sense to me. But I became a fan when he started going through more hardships, and and he showed his maturity as a person. Um, our uh, his oldest daughter and my my firstborn daughter are about a year apart, so we kind of became fathers together. Um. For me, the, the, it's 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 surreal because when it first hit, my my body went. I was laying in the bed just looking on on my phone, and my my body kind of just went numb. And it was like, no, nah, that shit's not real. And then I kind of like got over it, kinda. My uh, you know, Wayne was over the house. We were talking about it, and then we just started watching the news and CNN and the Pro Bowl, and they kept interrupting and they kept talking to other people. And the more and more as things came out, when we started learning about uh, you know the potential of it being his his m- multiple kids or just the one daughter. And then as the day went on, I mean, I I started drinking. Um, but as, <laughs> For real. I, I mean, I, I had to. But as the day went on, it just started weighing more and more and more. And um, we have the, this new VR game, that, you know, I've been talking about off, off air. But, like, I was just watching my youngest daughter, Devin, who's nine, about to be ten, and watching her play and – watching the smile that she had on her face and they constantly showing you know Gigi smile and 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 the the kind of relationship that they had um, I mean that was basically his twin and it's like as as much of you know my name is dad on this show I've I I I I can't possibly be as good as a father as it seemed that he was to his girls and I have 3 of them and I was like at it, a certain point in the night, I, I just had, we were watching a show and I just had to have Devin lay with me and I just had to hold her just to kind of understand and like grasp that because it's like you, you never know when shit like this happens and, and how it's going to affect you. And then everybody kind of went to sleep and I was like, you know what, I'm on this workout kick. So I started doing the boxing thing. Started boxing and then like I went upstairs to take a shower and the shit just hit me like a ton of bricks and I had... I had to release and let all that shit out so I can actually cope because being in LA, not f- being from LA, it's everywhere. It's it's on uh, billboards on on the four hundred five. It's on buses now. Uh, the the skyscrapers are lit up. It's on everybody's feed. So th- the gravity of all that to me, it was it it was a big deal because coming from a place where I didn't necessarily like the guy, but then I became to respect him, and then I started to like him more. As he's gone along, I felt like I grew like he grew. And the fact that Gigi was on on the helicopter just kind of crushed me. That that's my reaction to it. Red <laughs> Um fuck you last for making me cry right now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, like my my first experience with the Lakers I don't remember I was four when they won the first championship I don't remember the season I remember the reactions of my parents I remember my father bringing the house speakers into the living room because that's the only way we can hear chick Hearns because nobody wanted to hear the other commentators that was on TV um, because chick Hearns was the greatest commentator of all time, and regardless of the sport, Chick Hearn was better though. Hey, let him rock off, man. Let him rock off. We gonna be us, no matter what. <laughs> Chicky baby. <laughs> so, like, for me, it goes back a long way. You know, that was, you know, I'm an old motherfucker, like y'all like to say. Um, so when there there was a long drought between my childhood and me becoming an adult and Kobe Bryant and Shaq, the first two thousand what was that uh, two thousand first championship, you know that was my adulthood, and 
that was after my mom passed away and she passed 95. The first good year I had in this world after my mom passed was 2000. And they were a part of that. And I mean that wholeheartedly. Like, there used to be a sports bar on um, Washington Boulevard and Inglewood Boulevard. And it's a, it's like a fire department now. But every fucking playoff game, I was there. It was like a family. For three years straight, we was there. If you wasn't a Laker fan, you couldn't come. If you came in and you wasn't a Laker fan, you got you had a problem. I mean, it was it was stars coming in. It was everything. I lived that right. Like that was my life. Every Laker game, it was something. Kobe and fucking we had fucking Kobe and Shaq. Right, like regardless of how much you hated us, we had Kobe and Shaq. And there was this thing that I was going through personally because, again, my mother died in 1995. That shit was five years later, and my life was just coming into normal normal hood. Like, I was just becoming normal after that. And that helped me become normal. And it's hard to understand that because it's like, okay, why is games help? Because I was celebrating. For the first time in a long time, I was celebrating. Mm. Anything. My mom passed, I was fucking homeless. For the first time in a long time, I was celebrating. And I'm not trying to like if it feels weird for me to be like to put this on that level like where that means that much but it did because it was celebration of my life getting back to normalcy right so for me even though magic kareem worthy all that shit was the first representation of laker life in my life i was a kid there's a difference when you're a kid and there's no pressure on your life. There's nothing going on. My first, when my life got back to normal, it was Kobe and Shaq helping me get back to normal. There were people in my life also, but that was a big part of that. That, that part of my life was fucking insane. And you guys know me. I'm not a fucking, um, I'm not sentimental. <laughs> not one bit. There's certain things that get me, though. Like when Stan Lee died, that shit fucked me up. When Kobe died, I didn't know what the fuck to do. And it ain't about me whatsoever, whatever. I didn't know what to do. It was like, wait the fuck? What is going on? And there's moments in your life where you have no idea what's going on. I still don't even know, like, really, yeah. what the fuck is going on? All I know yeah. it all I know is I'm ready to celebrate this man's life because he has shared in my life. And I will forever appreciate him for that. Yeah, I, I agree. We're we're gonna do that real quick. Um I just wanna say to echo Les's point, I, I felt the same way. You know, I can't I still can't put it into perspective, like what this means. Hmm. Like Kobe Bryant did is just not a sentence that equates to anything because to me, he was still so present. Like I'm not, I've been to LA every year for the last, I don't know, 15 years, but hmm. to me, he was still the face of the Lakers. Like we were just talking about him Saturday night because LeBron passed him. So people were talking a lot about, um, you know, his legacy and, no, I can't, and to sort of what Kenyon was saying, I can't think of a day, a full day that goes by when I didn't think of Kobe or something that he did or said that like applied to how I approach, you know, my, my everyday life, uh, or at least be motivated by something that he, that he did. And I kind of look at it like Kobe was entering that, that 444 stage of his life. Like for men, you, especially for black men, we know what that means without even saying it. 
and he just has so much to give and to 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 just share with the world and like where he was about to come full circle as a person and it's like he died after the first song and like people always say like oh well he was you know in a better place so he was experienced it's like no no as great as he was on the court like there was so much inside of him as a person that he had started to give us and it just got ripped out um so but to Omar's point let's celebrate the man's life uh, I'm gonna ask everybody their favorite Kobe moment I'll start for me and just saying it was by far the uh, Matt Barnes inbound pass <laughs> pump fake where he put the ball this far away from Kobe's face and that psycho motherfucker didn't flinch. Like you do that to a hundred people, a hundred people are at least going to blink and Kobe didn't flinch. And to me, I think that represented Kobe in a nutshell. He was unwavering. He was afraid of any player or moment. He wanted that shit. Um, so kick it back to Ken, your favorite moment. That's a hard question to answer. I mean, you know, he has so many highlights. Um, you know, I saw 81 in person. I saw his three highest scoring games in person. Uh, 81, uh, 60, 65, I think, on Portland. 62 against Dallas in three quarters. But as a Laker fan, it has to be like those random road games in like Minnesota and Sacramento and Memphis where he was just clutch. Like... The clutch moniker didn't come because of game winners on the primetime games. It was those regular random road games where, you know, dudes that went out the previous night, went out the club or did whatever, and they didn't have it. And Kobe just had that, we're not losing a night, um, which I guess speaks to consistency. So, like, it's hard to pin it to one moment. It's It's so many, many moments that, you know, it's my favorite. I um, I really have two favorites, and they both happened in 2000. I remember being at my uh, friend Corey's mom and dad's house, Western Conference Finals Game 7. Mm -hmm. You know, we're down 15. 17. Was that Portland? Portland? Yeah, against Portland. And it was 25 to begin with. Right. right. Well, I'm talking <laughs> I mean, about going, going to the fourth four quarter. <laughs> yeah. And to watch a 21-year-old, take over the game and probably have the biggest <laughs> lob highlight in NBA history to Shaq was something that I'll never forget. Then in the finals, game four, Lakers up 2-1 in the series, Shaq fouls out, and Kobe, a 21-year-old, tells Shaq, <laughs> I got, got you. you. <laughs> I got Relax. you. Relax. I got you. Taking over. <laughs> they go into overtime, and guess what? Kobe had him. And we end up winning in six. But those are that, that 2000, like you said, 2000. My grandfather died after game two. Wow. His funeral was the day before the game six. So as you was talking, like I, I was in the middle of that. Yeah. You know, I literally it was I'm at a, my grandfather's funeral one day. I'm on Crenshaw celebrating the championship the next. And and those are that's my memory of Kobe that's my number one between those two I, I think for me it's um like like I said I didn't start out uh a fan of his so like it, it, there's only a couple people that I've watched in sports where it's like it's specifically in basketball if that if that motherfucker gets the ball there's <laughs> they're going to do everything in their power to get it done first person I saw like that and with my own eyes was Mike and the only person I've ever seen come close to that is Kobe so on on the court, if you're not if you're not my my team, and you're you're supposed to win or whatever, I'm I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna root for you. I normally root for the underdogs, and I never rooted for the Lakers, but I rooted for the Lakers and against the fucking Suns that year. And when he when he hit the shot to go into overtime, and when he he hit the shot to win the game, I think that's probably one of my my favorite Kobe moments on the court. Off the court, me and Kenyon used to joke years ago, like once he retires. He's going to be a fucking sociopath, and he's going to jail for killing somebody because basketball is his everything. If you've seen Kobe's Muse, he solidified that with, with that documentary. But seeing how funny he can be and, and what he's done outside and, and, again, working with his daughter, that fucking Jalen Rose 81 uh, Olive commercial is funny as fuck. <laughs> that's, 
that's another one of my favorite moments. Um, I for me, it's 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 a personal thing, but it's the it's that Portland game, uh, when they were down twenty five, um, but because I brought up the break shot earlier, I was at the break shot. It was with my my boy. Uh, his name was Ross, and. Like the break shot was my spot. That's where I went for to watch Laker games. They had all these pool tables, and they would during Laker games, especially in the playoffs, they would cover the pool tables with um with wood and put tablecloths over them so people can sit because they didn't have enough space. It was standing room only, like because people would normally play pool, but during the games, nobody wanted to play pool. They wanted to sit down. They wanted to order. So they would they would make these pool tables into into regular tables. So that game, there was Portland people, Portland fans there, a couple of them, five or six. And again, you know, when you up by 25, you talk shit. And I'll never forget that because like for me, that was, this, this was, this was it for me. Like this was a good time for me to be a Laker fan. This was a good time for me to be an adult. This everything was going right. And this time, these motherfuckers was talking shit and we couldn't say nothing. Down twenty five. By the time the fourth quarter came around, we was down what? It was down thirteen? Fifteen. Fifteen going into the fourth. So before the game had ended, we were coming back. We steadily we steadily gone. That wood that was on top of those pool tables. Me and my boy Ross had 400 people in this place slamming onto the pool tables because there was five or six Portland fans in the building. We had 400 people slamming on, talking about Portland sucks, and then L.A. And we were slamming. It came to the point where security came to us and was like, dog, y'all got to stop because the Portland folks was ready to leave. <laughs> And we came back and we won the game, of course, right? But it was this feeling I had of pride. Like, I, I don't know if you can understand that feeling. 400 folks slamming on pool tables. And these four, five people was ready to leave. Like, I, it was been, it's been a long time since I had a feeling like that. So to me, like... I, I get 81, I get the Dallas game. That, because I was personally, that was for me. Like, that was my favorite moment. So, so now we've, try to... we've now learned that Omar likes to incite riots. <laughs> <laughs> is, that a the... is that a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've, we've all seen it in person. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's not... so the, the, the last bit, I'll try to wrap all of this up into one question. I just, you know, want to know what you guys think about you know, his legacy, how you remember him, how do we uh, as as men, as fans, as, as the NBA as a league, how do you really move forward from here? Um, and I'll just say, to piggyback off of what Devin was saying, though, that we had always joked about, like, his post-career endeavors. And I think that was really our underestimation of how talented and, like, in tune with culture Kobe was. Because initially he did seem like, you know, like an outcast. Like, he was kind of socially awkward. Um, like early in his career, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that he didn't grow up here. Uh, but then you kind of saw around when they had that Olympic run, when he was like the OG on the team, and then the um, I think it was an All Star game in Vegas, where like he just seemed to be like opening up around the Carmelos, the LeBrons, like all of those guys to to really be, you know, their 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 OG and and open up and really and share a game. Like, huh? What was I think you're mistaken. He wasn't sure. Oh, he may be socially awkward. But part of the problem was he was here with Shaq, who was a over. <laughs> he was so out there, sure. so it makes him look makes it makes him look different. Yeah, that, I, don't, that I don't think I don't think that's but, fair for him to say about him. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Okay, I'm I'm happy you're keeping character despite everything <laughs> <laughs> going on. You, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, okay, you're John not going to switch up. Just fucking Kobe Cutter, because <laughs> you. you're wrong. Um, that's why. <laughs> You're closer than I am, so I sure. know. Um, but as I was saying, uh, for, Kobe, uh, for for opening up and sharing with those guys, and I think we all saw it. Like Kobe was about to set the content game, 
on yep. fucking fire. And it's just, it's disheartening to see this. Like we never saw a player retire and then remain this relevant post career that quick. Um, and still have an impact on the current game. Like it didn't hit me until earlier today that like, yo, there's going to be no more details. Like, granted, yes, yeah. Kobe and life, but like, just to think that that kind of thing is so normal in your life is is gone. And, um, they were and I think he really, Shit. he really, he really had the. All right, Omar, no, he had the uh, <laughs> potential to be <laughs> to, to be like more impactful, in my opinion, more impactful post career than um, than his actual playing career. Um, and the biggest thing for me is that I didn't realize until this week that like he's probably the most misunderstood person in sports like he despite all the stories and all that i don't think he was selfish i think he just wanted this one thing more than anyone ever wanted anything ever that he was willing to either run through you to get it or he was going to drag you to the finish line but at the end of the day he was he held other people to the same standard that he held himself like i'm the first one in the gym the last one to leave and if you're not ready to die for this goal then leave like get out tr- don't show up um but i think that one of the craziest things one of my friends pointed this out is that we've never as far as the nba goes we've never really experienced any nba great die like granted will chamberlain yes but he's significantly older than us kareem hakeem mike magic bird oscar dr j fucking Bill Russell is still alive. Like we've we've never experienced this. So I I just magic. I don't know. I I think this is just something we we gotta just find a way to just plug through and honor this guy as often and as thorough as we can. And these stories that the guy that the players and reporters and people are telling, like it's important and I think it keeps his legacy alive. All right. Um <clears throat> segue. Yeah. <laughs> Got some feet ball to talk about. <laughs> this, Super Bowl this still is foot it still is football season. <laughs> um we're gonna we're gonna run quickly through these bottoms. Uh these uh move on. Push through the lat tonight. Push the lat. <laughs> we're gonna run through these bottom one hundred. Uh we've got five teams left uh on our final show next week. Uh, and I might have just killed Omar. Uh, <laughs> uh, on our final show uh, next week, we will uh, recap uh, the 96 players, or we will recap all 100 players and then identify who we feel are the four worst players in NFL history. Uh, the teams we got left, we got the Cardinals, we got the Eagles, we got the Dolphins, we got the Texans, we've got the Bills. Uh, for time's sake, what we're gonna do, call out your three, but focus on the one uh that you that you feel like the most, uh, just so we track it. We'll start with the Cardinals, Junior Blue. I had Tom Knight. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I gotta tell you a little bit of something. He, yeah. was, pick no- he was pick number nine. <laughs> <laughs> he was pick number nine. And he was in the bottom third of I feel uh, like you made that up. <laughs> no. Greater <laughs> 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 player. <laughs> Listen. Listen, he was in the bottom third of uh rankings of cornerbacks for five seasons, but they kept him for five seasons. He had two interceptions his whole five year career. Wow. When did he play? He played in from ninety six to two thousand one. Yeah. Wow. All okay. right. Then you have Wendell Bryant. Oh, Tra- yeah. Uh-huh. Trash. Trash. Went half sack in three years, and that was the end of his career. You'll love number one, Matt Leinert. Ooh. Drafted really? Number, That's drafted dirty. Hey, hey, hey. Listen, <laughs> listen, listen to this. He was drafted number 10 overall, mm-hmm. right? He started on, 17 baby. games for the Cardinals. He made the cut. 11 of them was his fir- in his first year. Mm-hmm. He had 11 touchdowns and 12 interceptions. For the rest of his career, he had three touchdowns and eight interceptions, and that's why he's broadcasting now. Mm. He was a bus. Jesus, Matt. Yeah. It was Kyle, all good just hey, a week hey, ago. College was, life was, it was never special good a week him. ago. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's why he came back. <laughs> Dev, you got the, uh, Dev, you got the Eagles? I got the Eagles. Um, number three was not a draft pick. It was a trade, and I'm talking none other than Kerry Washington's husband, Nambi Asawa. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, signed at five years, $60 million, 25 guaranteed. 
they found out that he could only play man. <laughs> uh, and they wanted him to play zone. Yeah. Number two, uh, Danny Watkins, who was a guard uh, out of Baylor in the 2011 draft. Yes. Um, he, uh, he was 26 when he came in the league, years old. <laughs> and he was released at 28. He, <laughs> <laughs> he, didn't really opening, want, grand he, didn't, he didn't really want to play football. He wanted to be a firefighter, and he did that afterwards. He's still a fire, firefighter now. That's Come number on. two. Number one, uh, <laughs> Jerome McDougal, defensive end out of yeah. the U. Yeah. He was in the 2003 draft. Uh, they moved up uh, to pick him at 15. Um, he never started a game for the organization. He only had three sacks for his career as a DN, and one of those three resulted in a 30-yard penalty from him. Uh, <laughs> he was happy. He was, so he was drafted in 2003. He missed the 2005 season. Wait, did season. you say a 30-yard penalty? Yes. That's, that's two. Two. <laughs> two personal, personal fouls. fouls. <laughs> yeah. He missed the entire 2005 season because he was shot in the carjacking. Um, and he did come back to play one more season with the team, um, four games in 2008, and then he never played again. He's one of seven players drafted in the top 15 to never start an NFL game in 50 years. Wow, he. We need to check in on him next week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he might be there. He might be there. Yeah. Red O uh, has the Dolphins. So after two decades of the great Dan Marino, huh. and oh. two years after he retired, <laughs> they drafted Jamar Fletcher. Oh shit! I don't even know that one. Number twenty six overall in two thousand one. Um. So he was. <laughs> Despite the, oh, sorry, despite having Pro Bowlers Sam Madison and Patrick <laughs> Sertain on their roster, they decided to draft him instead of drafting Drew Brees. Our Super Bowl oh. preview is going to be <laughs> show. It's going to be a microwave. <laughs> so <laughs> you like Danny Glover and Jumanji uh, too. I, I, <laughs> 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 yo, he said, "Fuck that memo." Get the fuck out, yo. Get out. <laughs> Come on, dog. You got it, Come on. You got it. I'm good. You got it, Red Hawk. Kobe would not put up with this mess. Get to it. I get it. Get to it. <sighs> like I said, instead of drafting Drew Brees, they, they drafted Jamar Fletcher. Um, he lasted three seasons, started six games, and just picked off two passes. So the next two, they were drafted right after each other, one year after the other. <laughs> Number two is... Nick's Bosa's bitch ass daddy, John Bosa. Oh, snap. <laughs> so, if I you, see where he's going. If yeah. your son is a racist, you are fucking racist. So in 87, Miami needed to build a defense that matched the high powered offense um, by, by the quarterback. Don Shula went with defensive end John Bosa out of Boston College. Um, basically, he shit the bed out of day, uh, since day one, lasted three seasons. And recorded a grand total of seven sacks. So, Nick Bosa's daddy was a fucking bust. <laughs> the next year, <laughs> it's Joey's daddy too. Yeah, nah. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but but Nick playing in the Super Bowl yeah. next week. Yeah. So the next year, instead of drafting Thurman Thomas, mm. they drafted Eric Kumaro who basically was even a bigger bust than Nick's daddy. Um, he lasted three seasons again, never played with another team. Career ended after those three seasons. Never had a stat worth talking about. Shula, instead of drafting Thurman Thomas, who, who could have been paired with Marino, which would have made them fucking unstoppable, drafted not one, but two defensive players who never played after their three seasons in the NFL. And uh, fuck all y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Bitch we, motherfuckers. <laughs> we know. Uh, I had the Texans, thankfully, in one of our earlier episodes, uh, we covered uh, their bust. Uh, the top three, uh, number three, uh, Travis Johnson, 2005 pick, two sacks in four years. Uh, Omobi Okoye, uh, Nigerian 19-year-old, uh, nine and a half sacks, four years, number 10 pick. They trade up for him. 
Listen, I was so excited because the biggest bust makes the list. Brock Osweiler. Why does he make the list? Because he had 16 starts. If you count the two playoff starts, he's sight, sight, sight unseen. 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 <laughs> biggest bust. Kev, you got the Buffalo Bills. We're listening. Oh, I do it. And this is going to be quick because it was not easy. All right, number three, we have Mr. John McCargo, defensive tackle, 26 pick in the 06 draft out of NC State. He passed out in training camp during his rookie season. Uh, two sacks in 44 games. We know what that was. Second on my list is Mr. JP, the Juice Man Los. Ooh, out of Venice High School. LA's finest. Don't y'all run from this one. <laughs> Devin, you pay L.A. taxes. He's yours, too. Um, what made this worse is that he was picked in the 4 draft, which had Eli Mann and Phillip Rivers, Big Ben. Um, J.P. Losman was trash. He was just flat-out trash. And I hate to say this on the show where we're mourning. I hope his life is great now. His family's healthy. But what made this even worse was that there wasn't much quarterback depth left in this draft. So if they were hell-bent on drafting a career backup quarterback, the sixth god, Matt Schaub, was out there. Um, mm. Or a better bargain pick was Luke McCown. And if they shook him up really fast, they would also see his brother, Josh McCown. <laughs> <laughs> they would have got two quarterbacks, one draft. Two quarterbacks, one draft. That's Whatever. Funny. We'll move past that. Last but not least, number one on our list is Mr. Mike Williams. And then I realized when I saw his name that there are several NFL busts named several. Mike Williams. Williams. So, advice to anyone out there, last name Williams, do not name your child Mike, Kayla, or Michelle, because Michelle Williams, I believe, is also the name of the third member of Destiny's Child that everyone forgets. So, <laughs> mix this. Move the fuck on, Kev. With Mike, Williams. <laughs> Mike Williams, offensive tackle, fourth overall pick out of Texas, who's projected as a top two prospect for left tackle. Uh, he's widely considered one of the best picks in the draft. He started out blocking for, if you remember, Mr. Drew Bledsoe, who was sacked 54 times in 2002, thanks to Mr. Williams. Uh, Williams was eventually benched and lost his job to an undrafted free agent named Jason Peters. So if the Bills wanted to draft offensive linemen, they could have went Bryant McKinney, Super Bowl champ with the Ravens. Who knew? Um, and a few picks later, we had, you know, Dwight Freeney was on the board or, you know, mm. maybe the greatest safety ever, Edward Reed. Wow. Thanks, Buffalo. That was fun. And Kenyon, we're going to talk post show. Wrap you it did up, this babe. Buffalo Bill shit to me on purpose. <laughs> we're going to talk. We're going to talk. All right. Um, let's get to Super Bowl 54. Let's go. Um, and for those of you that are wondering, as I'm sure people listening at this point are like, why are we trying to get through? It's because uh, in honor uh, and in, and in, um, in memory of Kobe, and in, um... uh, we're going to do a 48 minute show uh the title of this episode is full 48 for number eight because that's what kobe did four minutes 45 seconds um <laughs> so <laughs> we've got kansas city <laughs> it's funny we've got kansas city uh going against san francisco in miami um and we'll start here because i'm sure you go to any website you can see breakdowns of the game uh the question i have for you guys and i'll start with you dad is uh, who will be the real MVP? And I'll pose the question this way. If Kansas City wins, it's because of... Because they were able to block that pass rush. Because you know they're going to throw it. And if San Francisco wins, it's because of... It's because they don't turn the ball over. Mm, Jimmy Garoppolo. Yes, specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Junior Blue. If Kansas City wins... It's because of they stopped the 49ers run and their offense stayed true to form. And if San Francisco wins, defensive line dominated and they ran up and down the field on the Kansas City Chiefs. Kev, if Kansas City wins, it's because. Like Devin said, they keep Mahomes clean. And if San Francisco wins, it's because. It's because Kansas City got off to yet another slow start. Uh, they protect mm. Jimmy G. And fucking Shanahan doesn't try to get cute like he did in the last Super Bowl. Huh. <laughs> Red O, if Kansas City wins. Because Mahomes played like the next quarterback to lead the NFL as the best quarterback in the league. And if San Francisco wins. Because Garoppolo was not a game manager and he put the team on his shoulders 
and he took them down the field and scored touchdowns. Interesting. Um, I agree uh, with Devin and Kevin. It's about the five big uglies on the line, for sure, uh, if Kansas City wins. Um, and if San Francisco wins, uh, it's specifically because of one Nick Bosa. <laughs> uh, Bitch-ass Bosa. <laughs> <laughs> um, game prediction and score. Listen, this is a like a true toss-up, besides the fact that I haven't looked at yeah. sports literally all this week. Um, but even coming into this week, I I mean, I could see it going any number 50, of ways. For sure. It's a 50-50 right. game for sure. It is the number one reason why folks should watch this game. I think this is going to be a great Super Bowl. Uh, Junior Blue, who you got? I have the Chiefs winning 31-28. to 31-28. I have the same score, but I have the Niners. You got the Niners winning. Yeah. Red O. 35-28. Chiefs. 35 28 Chiefs. I have it 23 to 21 in the fourth quarter. Pat Mahomes has the ball mm. and he scores a touchdown. 28 23 Kansas City. Kev. The 49ers are the better team. The 49ers are the better team. The 49ers are the better team and they're going <laughs> to lose 27 <laughs> Kansas City. <laughs> Kansas City 27-23. I don't know why. Yeah, it's a I mean it's really it's th- really I, a toss up. I think Andy Reid if you don't win it now. I'm I am <laughs> I will say this, it's been a long time since I felt this way. I am rooting for Andy Reid. The coach has got yeah. no tone for some shit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, for but, sure. But Andy but, Reid like But when we you know, Andy, come on. Do it or don't. Do it or don't. Yeah. 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 We got this places is, to be. This is your time to don't. If you don't, it's time for you to go. I'm not going to say that, but yeah. (laughs) If you don't do it now, you're never going to do it. That's a fact. (laughs) Well, we will see. Um, All right, before we get out of here, I wanted to end on one final note. Um, We're definitely going to end on a moment of silence for one Kobe Bean Bryant um, and his daughter, uh, Gianna Bryant, and also the seven other individuals um, that were on that helicopter uh, you know, we talked about Kobe at the beginning. We'll end it with Kobe. Um, and I'm interested in this as well. And uh, Kevin, I'll start with you, but just go around before we get out of here. One word, Kobe. Your one word for Kobe. Unapologetic. Red O. Focus. Relentless. Unforgettable. And I end on the GOAT. Rest in peace. In. We broke down the door, we came to win TLA season 4, it's a whole new game We the ages of change Whole new scope, with a whole new range It didn't exist, so we built our own lane We all knew the risk, it's a cold ass game But first and foremost, we reppin' the fans Because we nothing but fans, living out our dreams Crossing the pond with these 32 teams There's only one road and there's only five kings